there you go. <laughs> Um, my name is Sichen, um, and these are my three lovely assistants, Edmund, uh, Max, and Chi. And basically all four of us are from the Mountain View or the Bay Area Go Club. How we got to know about this is that I know that Vicky contacted, uh, contacted the SF Go Club first initially to see if anybody would come down to the beach. And since Matthew runs that club and they're relatively far away, they contacted us instead. So I've been learning Go for a really long time, um, maybe almost 20 something years. Um, and uh, same with all uh, these three fine gentlemen here, they've also been learning the game for quite a while. Uh, and hopefully today, this is you know relatively informal, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about the background in Go for those people that don't really know the history about it. And then, but mainly I want to talk about the history of Go in the United States and particularly on the West Coast, because that's information that I think a lot of people don't know that much about. And certainly I didn't before I actually uh, talked to some folks that, that actually knew a little bit about it. Um, so, so the first part, maybe the third, first 30 or 40 minutes will be just kind of me talking. Uh, if you have any questions, just yell it out. No need to raise your hand. This will be relatively informal. And then after 40 minutes, uh, basically I will, uh, by that time I would have taught some of the basic rules and then I think people can play it. Because uh, the important part about play, uh, learning Go is just to play it. They always say that, you know, the, the first 100 games of Go, you're gonna lose, right? And, and mainly, don't worry about it, everyone goes through this rite of passage, but, um, but it's important to, because the, range, the rules of Go are relatively simple, but I think it really, it takes a couple of games to kind of really figure out the objective and some of the rules, intricacies of the rules. So, um, so that will be the plan. And basically, um, when you guys pair off later, uh, my three lovely assistants here will basically uh, go around and kind of answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I'm actually really surprised about this turnout. I'm really, really glad about this turnout because usually when I run a workshop where people ask me to work, run a workshop, it's like seven people. So, uh, so I'm really glad uh, that, that people uh, have shown up for this event. So with that, with that in mind, I will kick off the presentation. Today we're gonna to talk about the game of Go and basically uh, these three, uh, these three uh, words are basically what Go is in the different languages. So in Chinese, it's Weixi. In uh, Japanese, it's Igo. And then in uh, Korean, it's Padu. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, it's mainly these three languages because these are three of the major countries that play this game. And in fact, Go is one of the uh, largest played games in the world because all three of these countries play it, more so than chess, actually. So, right, so what, what, what are some of the common facts that we know about Go, right? Well, it's one of the oldest games in the world. And basically, its origins trace back in China around 2,500 years ago. So that's around BC 500. And um, uh, it, it is definitely considered kind of to be the one of the oldest board games to survive to this present day. Its strategic depth is basically much higher than chess. And um, so you can consider Go as a type of game that's similar to chess and it, it takes a lot of strategic skill to play. The earliest reference to this game was in 4th century BC and um, it was originally played on a 17 by 17 grid, but now the standard game is played on a 19 by 19 grid. Now before you, you see a grid of nine by nine, right? That if you count the intersections, not the squares. Um, that's generally to teach newer comers to the game, but in, in general, the game is played on a 19 by 19, oh, oh okay, I should have done this, uh, 19 by 19 grid. Uh, uh, and, and then that basically was around 618 to 907 uh, uh, before, uh, BC. And um, nobody knows how this game came to be, and now everything has basically passed on to legend. So originally, People thought that it was the Chinese emperor Yao around 2300 BC that taught his, uh, uh, they called him his idiot son to be good at uh, uh, strategy, war strategy. And it, generally when it first started in China, it's considered more of an activity of the aristocratic class. So the aristocratic class basically value kind of these four things to be like a true gentleman. One of them is your ability to play Go. So if you were trying to, you know, woo a potential partner, you might be want to be good at Go. You definitely want to be good at calligraphy. Uh, you, you certainly is some sort of painting and also playing uh, the Chinese instrument, the Gu Qin. A Go generally among the, uh, the general population in China, uh, they like to play Chinese chess. So that you can think of as like a, analogous to Shogi. 
Yeah. These are just some pictures of you know what it takes for you to be a fine gentleman during that era. You have to be. Yeah, I, I can never do any of those things. So, like I said, it was a remainder 2500 BC. Uh, around 500 BC was it really when it first got mentioned, and it traveled to Japan and Korea around 735 in AD. And um, initially, basically, it was played by the samurai class for also strategic war training, and um, the game also. Uh, basically uh, play uh, became po uh, popular in the Japanese imperial court. So it's very similar to how it is in China. And um, I guess this is because of the close cultural exchange during that time. Go Ru, I think, really blew up in Japan around uh, 15, around the 1600s, where basically in the um, uh, schools of Go were formed. So you can think of these as uh, like different dojos that you would train like a martial art in. So these dojos popped up. And it was so important that the Japanese national government recognized it as a, as like a, is a, uh, it, the Japanese imperial government basically recognized it as a, uh, or basically gave a ton of support for for these ghost schools. And these ghost schools competed against each other, uh, kind of romanticized, like you know you can go to somebody's dojo, beat everybody, and then you know take their take their uh, you know their, their their tag or their name. So. So the best player among that time really uh, was named uh, the, the Honimbo. And um, basically every year, the, the Shogun would ask you know, the best players at each school, and then they would come to the Imperial Castle, and then they, they would play a game in front of the, the Emperor. Yeah, so that's how important this game was uh, uh, culturally in Japan. Okay, so I spread through 2,000 years of history really quick, right? But I really want to talk about Go in the uh, in 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 the U.S. and go on the West Coast because a lot of what I had just talked about is actually you can easily find it you know on a Wikipedia page or online when you search for Go. But what I'm about to talk about I think is a lot less well known about the history of Go in the Bay Area in the Bay Area. And it's important to talk about this because I think uh, how the uh, Go developed in the West Coast uh, ties together with a lot of historical events. So the war in the World War, the World War II had a big impact on the development and spread of Go in the West, and same with uh, the Japanese internment in the 1940s. So this actually, um, so I'll talk about how all of these tie together and how 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 affected the spread of Go in the West, in particular the the West Coast. So um, really, Go was. Uh, didn't really become to start to become popular in the West until like the 19th century, and um, I think the first earliest accounts of it are basically when uh, uh, this fine gentleman Edward Laster, a, a German uh, engineer, uh, learned about it when he was in Germany. So he he was a, ger a German businessman, and um, he was also an international master in chess, and he was really really distantly related to the world champion uh, Emmanuel Lasker, very distantly related. And uh, for those that you, you that do play chess, Emmanuel Lasker is one of the best uh, chess players uh, uh, in history. And basically I mentioned this is that he, while he was an international master in chess, uh, he actually got, uh, uh, he got uh, introduced to this game uh, basically around 1905. And when he brought it from Germany, he started the New York Go Club. Uh, which is basically considered kind of one of the first Go clubs in the U.S. And he taught his uh, his friend, Emmanuel Lasker, uh, how to play, and they both kind of really fell in love with the game because they were really impressed by the deep deep strategy uh, in it. And um, yeah, so, so basically 1905 is the general history of when it was seen in the West, and then basically in 1935, the American Go Association was formed, and that's kind of where all of our events are uh, they, they? They're basically how we're all. All of us are kind of under this umbrella, under uh, organization of the American Go Association. Go really, you know, in the Bay Area has a really colorful history. I think, and it's mostly the Go scene in San Francisco in the past 150 years. Um, so really, in the Bay Area, it started in the 1900s, and the main club was located in San Francisco in Little Tokyo. And back then, there were constant fights that broke out and like a bunch of murders happen. I mean, we don't want to get into that, but usually Go is a game where you first, it's still common today, where you put some money on the table, and you say, you know, I bet you $20 I can beat you. So it's, it's, there's a lot of money involved. So it was, you know, what I mean is that not the, not the, 
nicest rabble that you're hanging around with here. So, um, but originally the club was started by a small group of Japanese immigrants in the 1900s in San Francisco. Uh, really, in the 1920s, there existed two separate go clubs in SF. And um, basically the dues were around 50 cents a month, and I believe they were renting that building for $10 a, uh, uh, $10 a month. So 50 cents was the membership, and then $10 was the, was the uh, monthly rate. Now I see some of you shaking your heads thinking that this is a small amount, but $10 in 1900s, actually, they struggled to pay that. So basically, um, in both clubs, there were roughly 10 members, so combined there were 20 members, and because you know rent was quite high at $10 a month, yeah, no, first world problems, right? But uh, basically a Zen priest from the SF Zen temple, which still exists today, the Sokoji temple, <coughs> suggested that, hey, why don't you guys just merge, right? That makes perfect, and then you don't have to pay dues. And then the, and then the reason they actually merged is like, uh, they thought that they could learn more about the go styles of the other group. So they're like, hey, that's not a bad idea. So, and that's a photo of the Sokoji temple back in the, back in I think the, the 50s or 60s or something like that. But I just want to point out that none of the Go clubs nowadays look as nice as that. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, I, I wish we, yeah, we had a nice place like that. Uh, it started in the early 1900s and then uh, all the way up to the 1930s, right? And how did really, uh, but you know, this is a very small group, right? That really had no connections to, you know, the Japanese Go Association or to any, the, the or, to, or to organizations on the East. Uh, on the on the east, where they could you know get more funding or get basically get funding to kind of get more equipment, right? And um, one of the really key people that spread go in San Fran uh, in San Francisco was uh, by this gentleman, uh, Mr. Yokata. And um, basically, Mr. Yokata was a postmaster on this ship, the Samu the Samu Maru. And uh, this ship basically was an ocean liner that traveled between uh, Yokohama and San Francisco. And um, Mr. Yokata was a really, really avid fan of Go. So every time that he would come to San Francisco from Yokohama, he would stop by the SF Go Club and then he would play a couple of rounds. And um, so this ship is actually quite, has quite a bit of history with it as well, if you search it up. Well, we'll get to that soon, but uh, during his trips, and when, when he was here for a couple of days at the SF Go Club, he said that he was inspired by the ghost spirit of the members there. So he was determined to use his connections in Japan to connect the Japanese Go Association there, which was still in its infancy at that time. And then, uh, you know, link, uh, have a, some sort of cultural exchange between these clubs. So this is the picture, uh, the first bullet is just kind of what I had mentioned. And this is basically a picture of the current Japanese Go Association in Tokyo. And due to the help of Mr. Yokata, there were a lot of cultural exchanges between the Japanese Go Association and the SF Go Club. And basically, the SL Go Club became the first international branch of the Nihon Kin in 1936. Now, Mr. Yokata, unfortunately, he it was his, his fate is relatively sad because in 1940s, during the war, the Samu Maru actually got sank by an American ship when it was traveling between Yokohama and the SF. So, um, and yeah, so that's really unfortunate because Mr. Yokata would basically collect dues from, oh, well, collect money from um, the SF Go Club so he can go back to Japan, buy really high quality uh, equipment, and then bring it back uh, to SF. And the accounts back then were that he lived in this very small cabin on that ship, and he has so many Go boards on that cabin that he could basically sleep on them. So you would put all the boards together and form a makeshift with a wooden bed. So yeah, so so so, so this, is, this is kind of how uh, the, the, the SF Go Club kind of became more recognized uh, by the Japanese Gozos. After this linkage, this link between the Japanese Gozos and the SF Go Club was made, uh, I mentioned uh, the Honimbo is basically the title of the, of the best Japanese Go player in Japan, right? And the current uh, master uh, of uh, the House of Honimbo basically wrote, uh, uh, was, was so happy with the news that he, he uh, drew like a large scale memorable example of his, of his calligraphy. And I think this actually belongs in the SF Go Club to this day. This was like all in the 1900s and the 1930s, right? Um, and now with the coming of the war, uh, this basically spelled the end of the SF uh, Go Club. Because in 1942, as we probably all know, is that basically the, the Japanese immigrants in California were all dispossessed, dispossessed of their land and then were forced to move to relocation camps. So what happened, to that Go Club, it was originally 
uh, basically all the Go equipment had to be abandoned and everyone had to move, right? So um, in that original place, that temple that they were using, um, it had to be, uh, it was re uh, basically turned back, turned into a place to house like uh, more, more for the poor. So, so, that, that's, so that kind of spelled the end of the SF Go Club. So ironically, the end of the SF Go Club actually allowed Go to flourish. So, um, and the reason being is that in the camps, activities were actually really limited. So basically a lot of uh, Japanese immigrants in the camps, this was taken from uh, the Kuskia camp in Idaho. They just played Go morning, day, and night. And uh, so, um, so they were basically, they had no Go equipment, right? So we, they actually just made Go equipment from paper, as you see here. They would draw them on paper, and then they would make stones out of like clay. And then uh, later on, you'll see they'll make uh, stones out of buttons as well. And people play morning, day, and night, and like everyone basically increased in considerable strength. In fact, there's a funny story, is that before the war, the Japanese Go Association sent professionals from Japan to play the players at the SF Go Club. And back then, they, the professional that they sent, I believe it was Mr. Fukuda, sixth on professional, he played the members of the SF Go Club and he beat them single-handedly, no resistance, right? So, see, he went back to the Nihon case like, well, everybody's not that strong, right? So then, but then after the war, uh, Ms. The, uh, the Nihon Kin sent Mr. Fukuda on another diplomatic mission to the SF Go Club and he basically lost all of his games. <laughs> so, yeah, so the second point, many camp tasks were left to the wayside. There's a good story of this that uh, they told me is that there was, a camp, there was a group of individuals in one of the camps that were supposed to be taking care of the pigs, right? Uh, to, to raise them. And uh, this is one of the Japanese relocation camps. And uh, they neglected their duties so much because they were playing Go and instead, of feeding the pigs properly, they actually fed their rice rations to the pigs. So they were like, oh, I'm too lazy to feed the pigs, I'm gonna play some Go, so I'm gonna feed uh, the, my, my rice rations to the pigs. And then they had a, like, a pig competition, like who, rose, uh, who raised the, the, you know, the, the biggest pig, right? And then these guys won, but then afterwards, when they went to go slaughter the pig for meat, they found it was like completely inedible because it was just all fat, because they had forced, they just fed this pig so much, so much rice that all the, all the, all the meat was really just fat. So, uh, yeah, so the, this is one of the stories of just basically how, how, you know, how much Go people play. Uh, as you know, probably in the camps that, that the Go, Go equipment is really, really hard to, good Go equipment is really, really hard to come by. So, uh, you know, th thanks for Tom for donating all of these Go, uh, this, this Go equipment, because good Go equipment is really not easy to come by. And um, so what they did was that uh, they basically made Go equipment for paper and cloth. And some were made of clay, and uh, basically people made uh, makeshift wooden boards. Now in Go, when you play stones, you tend to like slap it down on the board, and when you make Go stones out of clay, you can imagine that they broke easily. So um, what happened is that they actually, afterwards, they used buttons instead. So they take the buttons off their shirts, and they would use buttons that were black and, and white, and then use those as Go stones. So the SF Go Club didn't really know what the ranking system was like in Go, and I'll explain a little bit about that. The ranking system of Go is from negative 30 to positive 6. Negative rankings are called Q rankings, positive rankings are called Don rankings. And you know, the higher you go, the better you are. And um, so Mr. Fukuda is a 6 Don professional, he's, like, he's one of the strongest, right? But the SF Go Club members didn't really have a good handle of what the ratings were. So they actually had their own rating system. So they had their, they, they still had the Don rating system. Oh, one, one thing I forgot to mention is that, you know, karate actually gets a lot of its uh, ranking system from, actually from Go. Is that if you're one, uh, if you're a black belt, you're equivalent to one Don. So, so that's exactly how Go rankings are, are like. So that, you know, when you reach one Don in Go, you're, you're a pretty good player at that point. So you can be considered kind of like a black belt. So Mr. Fukuda, you know, was, pretty darn good. <laughs> but uh, when Mr. Fukuda came and then he lost all of his matches, right? And then he asked everybody what everybody's rank was. They were saying, oh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, oh, so the SF Go Club had its own ranking system, I forgot to mention. Uh, since they did, so they have Don ranks, but they split it into one Don regular and then one Don junior. So if you were a one Don, if you were gonna get promoted, you would get promoted to two Don junior. And then from two Don junior, you get promoted to two Don regular. And when Mr. Fukuda came, he found that the rating system made absolutely no sense because when he played those players and the player said, hey, Mr. Fukuda, I'm, I'm one Don, right? But then when Mr. Fukuda played him and then lost 
you know, lost miserably. He's like, well, he promoted everybody on the spot by two stones. So I, I guess that illustrates how much Go people played again. <laughs> so yeah, so this, so that's so basically after that they abolished the junior and regular system at the SF Go Club, and now it's more. It's now uh, back then it, they made it in line with the Japanese Go Association. And really, uh, I think after the 1960s, the Go Go has really. Uh, started to attract, you know, not just Japanese people, but also people of all ethnicities. So when you go to the SF Go Club now, you'll see many people who are interested in Go. Um, and uh, currently, and uh, things have been pretty eventful after the after the war, in which you know we're able to promote more events and then uh, have tournaments. So we're really really glad to to see you know Go continue continue forward in this path. And um, Still, uh, the, the current activities of the Bay Area Go Club, uh, including us and SF Go Club, uh, I mean, mostly SF Go Club, but they will host pros from other countries to come, but this time not just from Japan. So they continue to do this day, continue to do this to this day. So they will host uh, Japanese professionals, or they will host Korean professionals, or Chinese professionals. And uh, we also organize uh, tournaments as well. The Go Club now also has much more connections, not just to the Japanese Go Association here, the SF Go Club, but also to the Chinese and the Korean Go Associations as well. And here, I just want to give some photos. So this is the original spot at the, uh, uh, I believe this is 1881 Bush Street, basically at the temple that they were hosting at. And this player was playing basically 10 or 20 games at once, and he is one of, considered one of the best Go players in history. Uh, his name is Go Sagan, a Chinese Go professional. So this, I believe, is after the war, where where they invited, you know, uh, uh, him to come and play. And as you can see, by the end of the war, there were not just Japanese people there, but there were, you know, people of all ethnicities there playing Go. Yeah. So this was a pretty important event. These are all the, the old pictures of back then of the Go Club. It's actually bigger than we have it now. I'm kind of envious, but uh, yeah, definitely not this many. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, so you can see kind of still the the remnants that they were in uh, a temple. If you see back there, it's actually like a praying sort of altar, and um, yeah, and uh, everyone's also dressed nicer nicer than <laughs> the Go folks today. But uh, yeah, question: Are there any women in the Go club? Are there bylaws that say you can't? No, 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 no. Very very good question. I. Uh, the, the, in the 1920s to the 1970s, Go is the, those Go clubs in SF are basically predominantly men. Yeah, predominantly men. Um, and I think uh, to answer your question, it's still like this today, where there are the the theme, there are different tournaments for men and women. Uh, and I think that's a remnant of the of how it was always held, mm -hmm. is that there's separate tournaments for men and women. And in general, I think uh, men, I think in, in Go are are still better. But I hope this is still, you know, this will change. Yeah. But I think it's just because there's just more men playing the game than than anything. Is there a single woman in this picture? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. And this is a picture of what it looks like now today, right? So um, this is basically the SF Go Club now. You can compare it. I think they had more people back then, but uh, uh, ignore that point. But. Uh, um, yeah, so that's the, 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 you know, since 1935, kind of that's the plaque, and this is where they host it now. It's in Japantown next to the hotel. Um, there's a hotel there, but then uh, it's above the ice cream shop, if any of you know where that is. But uh, <laughs> So if my lovely assistants will hold up the board, I'll explain the rules. Uh, the rules of Go, basically, it's you can think of it about it as you're a general and you're trying to conquer territory. It's about trying to surround territory. So the, the point of the game, if you see this board, board position, it's like you see that black has surrounded this border, which means that the, the empty intersections it has surrounded its own territory. So one of the goals of Go is that you want to place stones on the intersections such that you surround empty intersections. So in this picture, you see that black kind of has this border here that surrounds the pieces in here, or the, the, the empty spots in here. And you can see that white, for example, has a border here that kind of surrounds the empty intersections over here. So yeah. the points you get are the empty spaces you surround? Yes, that is right, that is right. Ah. So so basically at the end of the game, we count, uh, we count basically how much empty intersections you have plus uh, the captured oh. stones that you have. And I'll explain what capturing means. But that, this is kind of what an end game position looks like. How do you know it's yeah. the end? <laughs> that's a really great question, and that's what makes this game, I think, harder than chess, is that in chess, 
you can checkmate somebody and the game is over. But in Go, one of the difficult things is when does the game end, right? So it, that will just be something you'll have to get a feel for, but the game ends when both sides pass. But then you might ask, when do I say pass? And right now I just say, keep playing until you, you, it clicks. If you don't, if your opponent passes and then you don't have to be polite and say, I pass, right? You just keep playing, right? If you, there's nothing, if, if you don't understand why the game has ended. Uh, the goal, surround as much territory as possible. And while surrounding as much territory as possible, try to capture as many of the opponent's pieces as possible. So what I mean by capturing, I'll explain now. Okay, so now we can go go to the board. Well, so how you play goes that first black moves, oops, don't worry about it. first black moves and then followed by white. And then you take turns, you take turns. Once you place the stones on the board, you can no longer move it. So, so for example, well, I'm gonna talk about capturing and this is one of the biggest rules of go. Is that for, so for example, if black goes here, right? And then say white goes here. So, so if black goes first, there's this concept of what we call liberties. So the liberties of a piece is basically the empty intersections on the left, top, right, and bottom. We don't count the diagonals. So for this piece, whenever you place it down and move down, we say that this piece has four liberties. Now suppose white passes just for just for uh, explanation. So everybody can see. Oh yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, so here, four liberties. One, two, three, and four, right? So suppose white, uh, so white, so suppose white plays. Yeah. So now, after white plays, black now has how many liberties? One, two, three liberties, right? Suppose black passes again. Okay. If black passes, black passes again, black has two liberties now, right? Suppose, suppose black passes. Now, black has one liberty. Why would it pass? Yeah, uh, just to explain the rules. Oh. Usually you wouldn't pass. Yeah, just the post. Yeah, bear, uh, bear with me for this thought experiment just for a, a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, so when black has its last liberty, the next move that you play, you will basically, what we call, capture that piece. So when you play here, you get to take it off the board. Yeah. So let me give another example. Suppose I have this piece, right? And then suppose white passes. Again, thought experiment. So then so, suppose black plays here, right? So how many liberties does do these stones have together? They have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So when white plays all of those moves, white gets to capture it off the board. So white plays here, black passes, say for example, and then here, uh, this has four liberties now, right? Three liberties, two liberties, and then one liberty. There, here. Now you get to capture both of these. So when you go back to this to this diagram, you see that uh, the liberties around the piece, uh, the the empty intersections around the piece are the liberties. So this stone has four liberties, and when you look at that group of black stones, it has. How many is that? I can't count? Two, five, six, seven liberties, right? The black pieces. And white has one, two, three, four, five, five liberties. Yeah. So when you start playing Go, your your two goals, you should have two goals in mind. Try to surround as much empty intersections as you can. Second one, try to capture as many pieces as you can. This is an example. In this case, black has one liberty, those two pieces. And after white plays, white will capture black. The rules are really simple, I promise you, we're almost done. But one, uh, you must place stones on the intersections. And two, you can only place moves which have positive liberties. So, so I'll give an example, unless you are capturing another group in which then you can play a move with zero liberties. So I'll give an example. So when I place this move, right, as four liberties, right? Um, so what is an example where, so, so, these, so, I can, so everyone knows now that we can play moves that have positive liberties, but when, So, uh, so how many liberties do these three stones have? One. One. How many liberties do these three stones have? One. One, right? So when white plays here, white has zero liberties, right? But if you're capturing a group, you can play You can play them with zero liberties. So after you play here, you capture this, and you also capture that, right? 
And then finally, the final rule of Go is that you cannot repeat the same board position. And what do I mean by that? And this is what we call co-fights. So how do you repeat the same board position, right? Yeah, thank you. Suppose, oh. suppose the board just, oh, whoops, not like that. But suppose the board looks like, looks like this, right? Just this whole board looks like this. So, so how many liberties does this piece have? One. Right. One, right? So when, when white plays here, white can take it off the board, right? So, but oh this rule is in place to prevent, you know, people from taking, and how many liberties now does this system have? One. One, right? So if you just keep on taking each other's pieces all the time, the game just ends in perpetuity, right? <laughs> so this rule is set in place so these situations don't happen. Is that, is that you can never repeat the same board position because if you play here, the board position is repeated. Oh, no. oh, but you can play again if you wait a move. Yes, that's right. Because if you play, on, uh, so suppose originally white captures, if black plays another move elsewhere, right? And suppose white plays elsewhere, black can play here because it doesn't repeat the same board position. Um, right after. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the, so that's the rule of co is what we is what we say. <laughs> so really, that's it. Really. So from these three rules, there's actually a lot of emergent strategy that just comes from these three simple rules. So the reason I talk about this is that this is a bit more advanced, but I think you'll get to know about it soon enough, is that you might wonder, well, if I can capture pieces, when can I not capture groups of pieces, right? Like, like if I, can I just always capture somebody's uh, uh, groups as, as long as I fill in all of their liberties, right? So I'm gonna give an example where you cannot capture a group like you just literally cannot take it off the board anymore after it because there's no way to fill in all of its liberties the concept of basically being alive or dead being a, a live group or a dead group so how many first of all how many liberties does this white group have as, as a lot right one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen and then seventeen eighteen nineteen wow. right <laughs> How do you determine who's black and who's white? Oh, yeah. In the beginning, the, in the beginning, basically, you go by roko nigiri. Uh, this is a part where you, is it white? I forgot. It's, it's white. Yeah, white. Oh, white grabs a random amount of stones, holding his hand, and then black puts either one stone down uh, to sing, to signal that he thinks the 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 amount of stones are is odd. And then, or he puts two stones down to signal to the opponent that he thinks whatever you have in his hand is uh, even. So as white, I'll grab a couple of stones and my guess, right? And then black will be like, okay, I think it's even. So he puts two stones down. And if it's even, then black gets to choose the color. If he's wrong, he chooses, uh, then the, the other player gets to choose. Yeah. And then normally at a go uh, study, do you play one opponent and you move on to the next game? Or do you oh, no, then there's no rule. Person? No, no rule? yeah, there's no rule about that. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, so suppose white white's suppose white plays here, right? Now I ask you, is it possible to capture white's pieces? No. 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 And why is it? It comes from the original rules. Can black play here? No, you capture yourself. Yeah, because black has zero liberties, and like I said, you can only play a move with zero liberty if you're going to capture somebody's groups. Oh. Right, but when you play here, white has an, another liberty here, so this is an illegal move. And same reasoning with this move. So in this situation, white can no longer be captured anymore. So in these positions, we count these two points as white's points because black the black cannot go inside. Right. So so basically, when you capture more and more pieces, you'll you'll find out that a lot of the situations. Uh, no matter where black goes inside, white will always live. And that's basically your territory. So you'll have to uh, get a feel for this as you play. But one other thing is that, is that suppose black plays first, then black can capture white. Where would black play? In the middle, right? So now white has two liberties. So would white play here? That gets rid of his own liberty out here, right? White would only have one. So then black would capture this and take everything off the board, right? Because it, black can play this because it's a zero liberty move, but he's capturing white, so it's valid, right? And, and so really it doesn't matter where white plays, right? He's already dead. So white can play elsewhere on the board and black can of course play here uh, if he wants, but white has uh, two liberties left, right? If black plays here, one liberty, right? But black also has one liberty. 
right? So you might say, what happens if I capture black? Yeah. That's fine. Oh. Black can go in again, oh. right? And if you capture again, black, white now has one liberty. Oh. So white will capture now everything. Black. Black. Yeah, so really black. black came out as the victor Victor here, even though you both captured pieces along the way. <laughs> so basically, what we say is that if white plays this, we count, we say that white is alive. If black plays this, then white is dead. White is dead. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't matter where white plays next. Uh, yeah, so, so, the, so a general rule of go, we call this two eyes live, because you have two. One eye, you, you die. <laughs> Even if it's a large eye. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So a lot of these rules, like life and death, are emergent strategy, just emergent strategy that comes from those three simple rules, which makes Go really complex. Because it has very little rules, but we can extrapolate from it is a lot. Normally, how long does a game last? Yeah, well, um, uh, usually, you know, you can play. A, so ter uh, world, world championships, generally, every person has around two hours. The, the longest tournament, I think, is three hours per person. But on a nine by nine board, they can you know, last 30 minutes, I think, 30 to 40. But on a larger board, depending on how, you know, how slow you're thinking or you know, how much time you're taking, it can last up to six by a highly doubt. A normal game would only be an hour and a half, maybe, I would say. Yeah, so, so now let's go back to this diagram, right? You can see that black has kind of surrounded the, the, cor the corner here. Uh, with the with the red that I've indicated, right? But of course, there's white pieces inside, right? But really, once you play for a while, you actually realize that no matter where white plays inside those intersections, he's already dead. So when you play when you play more and more and go, you realize, hey, as white, for example, that you realize that no matter where I play inside, I'm already dead. This will take some experience, but um, but that's why we count the lower right as black's territory because it actually it doesn't matter where white plays inside. Black can always kill you with a sequence of moves. Yeah, so that, that, that's the part where it will take a bit uh, difficulty adjusting to because you need to kind of, at the end of the game, you have to first, uh, first of all, to end the game, both of you have to say pass, right? That means that you kind of already agree that that's black's territory. But if you don't agree as white, just keep playing, right? Yeah. So that's why I recommend when you just start out and play the game, Keep playing. Don't pass because you're being polite. Go was never a polite game to begin with. No. The last part is I kind of want to talk about just well, two slides about computer Go because this is more recent, right? This diagram just shows you like kind of the complexity of Go is that in chess, we always like to compare ourselves to chess because we're probably just, we're, we're, we're embarrassed to have so many more players than we do on the West Coast. We have to you know, give diagrams of complexity to, to justify our existence. But anyways, um, so for chess, you can see that how from the board sizes for simplicity, right? So chess has 64, uh, 64 uh, legal, uh, possible places where you can play a move, yeah. and then Go has 361. And basically, the number of moves in Go in a game, the, the, la the second to last column is around 150 moves is, a, is the average game. Whereas in chess, it's roughly, what is it, uh, 80. Right, so you can tell that already from this that the complexity goes much, much larger. And now I want to talk about the more of the recent stuff, which is going computers, right? So in 1992, um, uh, chess, you know, uh, the best, uh, the best chess player, Gary Kasparov, was defeated by Deep Blue, right? And just to give you a measurement of how more, much more complex Go is, is that it, it was only until 2017 where the best human player was defeated by a computer, Lisa Dole of Korea. And this is a really interesting documentary that, that it, it, you don't have to understand Go at all, but this is a very well-made documentary that if you're interested in seeing was a, is, a, is a really, really pivotal moment, I would say, in artificial intelligence. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so that's really uh, the end of my uh, presentation. And uh, now I, I, I highly suggest you guys pair off and start playing games and then we'll walk through and ask us any questions that you may have. All right? Yeah, we're okay. huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think there may be more women back there. Yeah, you're perfectly safe. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so, oh, we still have the edges. Yeah, so, yeah, you can go wherever you want. Oh, yeah. I remember my grandpa playing. Oh, yeah? When I was a little kid. And he, I remember them. 
slamming on the board, you know what I'm going to put it here. Yeah, there. but maybe you should play here because you can surround more territory. Right. Oh. Uh, there's all surrounding and there's a border, so you don't have any people. So you can't actually go. Okay. Yeah. Oh, because I yeah. put this one here, but it had right, liberty. Right. So right. that was okay. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't take You went here? <laughs> there, yes, now you have two eyes here. So he would not be able to do it both at the same time. Like two groups of uh, like soldiers, you want to be like work with them. You know. So to pass? <laughs> it doesn't. No, you don't have to pass. You can play. <laughs> Wherever you want. Yeah. So you can, there's a lot of empty squares here. Sure. Yep. How many liberties? That's right. Where's the cheese? Cheese, cheese ball. <laughs> Go cheese ball chips. Can <laughs> they tell them how you, how you made the black oh, stones? Oh, so the black stones are used with activated charcoal powder. Totally digestible. So. <laughs> There you go. Who is keeping them all in the center? Yeah. Are you going to serve gonna these? Put, she's playing a game. I'm there. playing. Oh, like and then if it doesn't there. work, you just. No. You what do you just, do if it doesn't work? You just eat it. Does the flavor of the chocolate <laughs> one taste different? Is it chocolate? <laughs> <laughs>